so I'm hyperventilating a little bit. If I fall over, pick me up because I've got some things to say. Though we adore men individually, we agree that as a group they're rather stupid. That men are essential for procreation, but when it comes to pleasure, unnecessary. Dinosaurs eat men. Woman inherits the earth. Safety lights are for dudes. Safety lights are for dudes. <laughs> well, put some skates on. Be your own hero. Things in the air, Kristen. Yeah. Lord, please give it up for the dazzling vocal stylings of Miss Kimberly. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 87 of Citizen Dame, the podcast where awesome women talk about awful men and, you know, other stuff, too. Uh, I am Karen Peterson, joined, as always, by Lauren Humphreys-Brooks. Hello. And Kristen Lopez is once again off with, I don't even know who this time. She's, you know, do we even, do we even acknowledge Kristen anymore at this point, Lauren? <laughs> like, can no, we just... No, well, just, just said the fact that she hates Joy. I mean, I, I think that she's secretly dating Jason Statham, so that's a rumor that I would like to start. Yes, she is dating <laughs> Jason Statham, which is why she was trying to throw us off track with that whole saying he's not hot thing, which was, like, ridiculous. Um, yeah. She's she's slutting it up with Jason Statham. That's right. And that voice you hear <laughs> is none other than our own Kimberly Pierce. Yay, Yay! Hello! Yay! Welcome back, Kim! Th- thank you for having me. It's so exciting to have you back. Tell everybody where you've been and what you've been up to. What haven't I been doing? Um, Ooh, that it's... sounds scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> Who have you been doing? Slotting it up with Jason Statham. <laughs> <laughs> deltoids. Oh, all those deltoids. Oh, yeah. I didn't see the Meg for its quality as a film. I'll tell yeah. you that. You saw it for no other quality. No <laughs> No, I have been, like I said, I have been keeping it busy with uh, screenwriting. I finished, I think, I finished one that I was working on and have been doing my damnedest to market that sucker and falling face first into some research projects. If you follow me on Twitter, I've been trying to dive into classic kind of TV women writers and creators just trying to prove that, yes, they were there. They weren't as absent as everybody seems to think they were. So that's involved watching a lot of Gilligan's Island and lots of gun smoke. And I'm having an absolute blast with it. Awesome. Well, we are so glad cool. you're back today. We really have missed you a lot. No, oh, I missed you guys too. So, well, we're just going to dive right into the fun. And by fun, I mean, fuck the Venice Film Festival. Um <laughs> <laughs> So this was a fun story that popped up this week. This was in Yahoo News. Um, I should not try to pronounce this name because I'm going to butcher it and I don't want to do that. But um, there was an article that popped up in Yahoo News this week that is about Roman Polanski and Nate Parker and how they have movies that are going to be at Venice. And... um, this is not, there's nothing new in this article. It's all stuff that we already knew, but there was a quote in it that I loved so much. Um, loved because it's terrible. But uh, I wonder if it was the same one I screenshotted. It might have been. But um, let's see. So, yeah. So this is talking about, you know, the fact that the, these two guys have movies going there. There are only two women directors out of 21 that are in the running for the Golden Lion Prize for their films. And uh, then, of course, the director of the festival said he'd rather quit um, than than give in to the pressure of quotas, because that's what we're asking for, quotas. No, we're just asking for them to consider actual, you know, good movies by good directors. Um, But this part was, but feminist critics have only upped their attacks, accusing the festival of, quote, almost comically scant levels of self-awareness it's so true isn't it uh, it is yeah it is. lauren talk to us about this <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i actually i had no idea about nate parker i knew about polanski i did not know that nate parker was going to have a movie there you know what? Um, i think that might have been announced after we talked about it before after we talked about it Venice may before. have yeah 
And and I admittedly do not like I don't follow Venice incredibly closely. I kind of just pay attention to what comes out of it, um, and and what people begin talking about because I, I don't go to Venice, but um, I would like to. That would be fun. Maybe not this year. Uh, <laughs> Let's wait till Alberto Barbera retires or quits. Apparently, and yeah. yeah. So so I had no idea that Parker also had a film, and that's where you kind of begin going like you know Polanski. Polanski's been around for a long time. Polanski, you know, Polanski won an Oscar um, post the the rape case, all of that stuff. So it's not surprising if it, even though it is disappointing in this current climate, that Polanski is going to have a film there. You turn around with someone like Nate Parker, who has made what one movie that was initially kind of beloved, but then didn't do anything and sort of got pushed to the side as a result of some of as, uh, the the discussions about his rape case and um, and also just discussions about the issues that the film itself had. There were a lot of people that were like, this is not a great film, guys. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. kind of got a lot of praise and then sort of suddenly everyone was like, eh, was it really that good? It was one of those films that got a lot of early buzz and then did nothing. Um, so th- this is where you begin to go like, oh, this is just getting funny. I mean, it's, I'm angry, but I'm also laughing because how... Like what? It's like they're trying to do this now, and maybe they are. Maybe this is just like a you know, fuck those women, fuck those feminists, um, which I I wouldn't put it past some of the Italian uh, the Italian directors and and things like that. It, Italy has as much, if not more, of a problem with um, rape culture and with toxic masculinity than than the United States. But it is comical at this point. It's like this is this is just funny now. Like, I don't even, I, I, I'm struggling to even be completely mad about it because it's so funny. Um, but yeah, I don't know the, the Polanski film. I'll be interested to see what the actual critical reactions are to these films. Cause of course no one's seen them yet. Uh, right. and people are going to see them. And I, I will be interested to know about that conversation. Of course, it's an open question as to whether or not any of us actually want to watch them. Yeah. Well, apparently Spike Lee has seen Nate Parker's movie because he's traveling to Venice to support Parker and says, I haven't been affected by a film like this in a long, long time. So cool. Kim, what was the part that you screenshotted? Yeah, they, it was funny that Lauren mentioned comical because that is totally the word I would use with just how completely out of touch this red there was one particular quote it says numerous films this year deals with the themes of the feminine condition in this in the world which even when directed by men reveal a new sensitivity (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh i liked this one too this is from screen dailies fianola halligan (laughs) she says she imagined the festival director Barbera, quote, wandering the Lido hopelessly, singing the same mournful refrain, he can't find a female film director. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this year he's going to program the new film by a convicted child rapist. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, it really... The slap in the face that they would, you know, have a quote like that and try and tout how sensitive they are to feminine issues and then two. Mm-hmm. two female directors yeah it's it's appalling but it's it's so indicative isn't it i mean i think we're going to talk yeah. about this a little bit later that the, there's still this tendency that you know we're going to talk about the men who can talk about things like me too and things like feminism you know we're going to celebrate them but it rather than actually raising up female directors female voices female writers etc um, that it's just like, oh, well, we have this great idea, you know, we're going to make this movie. We're going to have it directed and written by men. <laughs> it's like, guys, are you not paying attention that maybe you're not the right ones to tell these stories anymore? In fact, maybe you never were. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it, it's... It is, it is getting funny. Like, it is at that point where you're just beginning, I'm just beginning to laugh at this stuff because you, you see it, and you see it with perfectly well-meaning men as well, just like in your day-to-day lives where men are saying like, oh, no, I totally get it. It's just like, no, you, you don't. You don't get it because you're not a woman. You don't understand. And that's okay for you to not understand, but you have to shut the fuck up and let us speak. Exactly, exactly. I mean, if... 
if Roman, if the uh, if this season continues how the previous ones have, and women directors get completely shut out again, yet I have to hear about Roman Polanski during the entire award season, I might burn it all down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as someone whose primary role in this industry is writing about and covering the awards, I would really have to think about how I approach this season altogether if people try to make Polanski a thing. I think that they're... uh, I hope Hollywood (laughs) is at least a little bit cognizant of what they're doing. It doesn't seem like there's a drumbeat to invite Polanski back so that he can, you know, accept his award by satellite or whatever, but... I just, I don't know. If they decide this movie is worthwhile and they want to support it, I don't know how I can do it. It's going to be really hard. So, yeah. But along the lines of problematic directors and horrible people, there was a tweet (laughs) this week. I think that this is, this is actually a very natural progression. Um, There was a tweet this week by... Robert Butler III, which is at director RB3. And this was an interesting conversation that popped up. He said, Rush Hour 2 is not a Brett Ratner film. It's a Chris Tucker, uh, Jackie Chan movie, period. (laughs) And then a few people were like, well, he directed it, though. And Lauren, you had some great insights on this. So I'm going to let you take it away. (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, I, I found this, I actually found this conversation really interesting because it feeds into one of my sort of favorite elements of film discussion and film theory, which is the issue of the death of the author. Uh, and, and, you know, so often we, we become very embedded in the concept of the director as the author of the film, whether or not that's fair. And, you know, and you can make, auteur theory is very complicated and there are arguments to be made for for and against it and for certain directors and against certain other directors but I, I think that one of the interesting things that came out of this conversation was this issue of how do you deal with films beloved films uh, that are made by or that include in some creative capacity whether as actors directors producers writers etc um, people that we now know or that we maybe have always known as as being really horrible people, people who are sexual abusers, rapists, harassers, generally just nasty human beings. I mean, there are whole gradations of of what we've been talking about in the past few years. Um, And and the fact of the matter is this has always been around. This issue has, uh, has never not been a part of the conversation in some capacity. We've become more aware of it right now because we've kind of ignored certain things, you know, and, and a good example is someone like Roman Polanski, who the accusations about him are, it's not like they recently came out. This was something that happened in 1977. Um, and this has still been, you know, a major conversation every single time his name is mentioned. And so how do you deal with that? How do you deal with a film like Rush Hour 2 or a film like Rosemary's Baby or a film like Baby Driver with Kevin Spacey? Um, where you know that this person has had major creative input into it and you appreciate maybe their creative input, but you also know that they're, that they're horrible people. And I, I think that we have to balance this. One of the issues that I had with this conversation was that there was this sense of like, we're going to call it, you know, a, a, a Chris Tucker, Jackie Chan movie. It's like, you can't ignore the existence of Ratner as a creative force in this film. You just can't. He was the director. You can't ignore his existence any more than you can ignore the, exist- the existence of Jackie Chan in that film. So to try to to mute that, to sort of ignore it and be like, well, we're not going to talk about him. No, I think we do have to talk about him. We have to talk about the fact that this man who has done horrible things and who is not a good person has made and been involved with making a piece of art that we really appreciate and that we like, and that that has to be part of the conversation at the same time. So I... It's difficult to tell, and, and you know, you get these different schools of thought and different ways of approaching films. There's no reason why you have to read Rush Hour 2 as a Brett Ratner film. Um, but at the same time, you can't just completely disown the fact that he was involved in the making of it. Yeah. So, it's complicated. <laughs> it is complicated. This is always complicated. And it's something like you pointed out. I mean, we've been talking about it since literally the beginning of this podcast 
uh, you know, in 20, what, 17. And it's, it's something that, I mean, I, I think I get what this person is saying. It's not that he's going to like, it's not that he's suggesting Brett Ratner somehow magically isn't, you know, the creative force behind Rush Hour 2, but in order to enjoy that movie, he just has to, for himself, delete that little tidbit from his his consciousness, you know? He's trying to make it less problematic for himself. Right, and that, that and that's something that, I mean, with me, I didn't see Chinatown or, or Rosemary's Baby for a really long time because of Polanski. And mm-hmm. I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, but this is a celebrated Jack Nicholson performance. This is supposed to be a really great, you know, like... I can look at it as the the performances, the the crafts that go into it. I can look past. Obviously, mm-hmm. you can't you can't ignore Polanski from those films, and I didn't. But I can also a- appreciate and focus my attention on the other things about those films, where I don't have to consciously think about the fact that oh my god, I'm watching a Roman Polanski movie. You know what I mean? Well, and I I think that that's where the argument for death of the author comes in. That actually one of the the easiest ways, and and in many ways the the most critically uh, the critically clean way of approaching a lot of these films is to approach Chinatown as Chinatown, right? Mm-hmm. As the text, and we're going to read and understand and interpret the text and criticize the text solely based upon what is contained within it, and we're not going to talk about it in terms of the rest of Polanski's oeuvre, and we're also not going to talk about in terms of the rest of Jack Nicholson's oeuvre. Right. Um, and that's okay, and that is that is a perfectly legitimate way to approach films. So that is that is a way to look at these films, and that's personally my preferred way, and I'm saying this as someone, my two favorite directors, <laughs> and like, and I completely admit this, and this is something that I've had to deal with over the years, my two favorite directors are Alfred Hitchcock and Roman Polanski. Like, <laughs> Seriously, I fucking love their films. I think that they have fantastic eyes. I think that they have fantastic themes. And I would read their films as, as part of a, a full oof. I know how fucking problematic these guys are. Mm-hmm. I know that. That is something that I've had to deal with in various ways over the course of my entire life, pretty much. And, and, and there are some things that I agree with in terms of interpretations of their work and some things that I don't. But you've got to be able to get past that. And you you have to be able to deal with those things also. I don't think that there's any value in saying, I'm just going to plug my ears about this. Because that's the danger of what's being suggested here, I think, is that we're just going to shut down and be like, okay, uh, Brett Ratner doesn't exist. Roman Polanski doesn't exist. Alfred Hitchcock doesn't exist. No, they do. And they were a part of the making of this film. Whether you like it or not, and you have to come to terms with that at some level. And and it might be uncomfortable, but that's something you still have to do. It usually is uncomfortable. Kim? Yeah. Well, it's like the, it's like the historical, because I, I was looking at kind of this discussion through, you know, my work with the classics, the classic film stuff. It's the, by wiping, you know, the acknowledgement of these guys from these films while trying to just plug our ears and pretend they don't exist we're forgetting about how how can we analyze what happened how can we remember how can we if we pretend it didn't exist i you know watching i was just watching a marx brothers movie um i I was just watching at the circus probably about a month ago and there's a very uncomfortable music sequence in there and you know in racial dealings we've (laughs) talked about this extensively on this podcast and to truly understand what happened we have to be able to see it and then that way you know looking at this stuff we can ensure it doesn't happen again by just plugging our ears and pretending brett ratner and you know polanski and woody allen who i will freely admit was one of my favorites we let all this go we let it drop away it's we have to acknowledge it or else it's just going to keep happening. Yeah. There was something you said, Lauren, and now I can't remember if it was on Twitter or if it was on our Slack channel, but um, you were talking about how it seems like it's only women that keep having to find ways to, Yeah. To can you, can you repeat that thought and kind of expand on it a little bit? I, I think that the idea that I had was that, um, and, and this, this has been part of my half facetious argument that 
women and 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 just people who are minorities in general, so queer people, uh, people of color, etc., um, have because we've spent all of our lives identifying with people who are not like us, we make better film critics mm -hmm. because we've been forced to. And so I think that women, in, in terms of this conversation, women have for a very long time had to recognize that some of our favorite artists hate us at some level, hate us as, as because of our genders um, and ha or have problems with us or treat, treat members of our gender in ways that we don't like and that we will never like. So we've had to navigate this issue. We've known for a very long time that some of the, the people who produce the art that we love are also not great people. And we've had to deal with that. Men seem to have not had to deal with that as explicitly as a lot of women have, at least a lot of women who, who are film critics or are art critics. And as a result, I, th I, I think that, that we actually have more of a nuance to our understanding of this stuff. We're less likely to just be like, oh, we're just gonna ignore the existence of this director, the existence of this actor in order to continue to enjoy something. It's like, no, we, we've kind of had to deal with their existence because that's pretty much all we've had. Um, well, looking at something like Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel, just look at the hostility and the male reactions to that. Yeah. A film where they're not the explicit lead, where they're not really that important to the film in any stretch. Suddenly they're rebelling and, you know, boycotting. Yeah, there's there's an empathetic response I think that a lot of um, that a lot of women have had. So again, solely because you know that's been the the fact of our lives. If you like anything, you have to deal with its problematic aspects, and you find ways to navigate that. And sometimes they're healthy ways, and sometimes they're not. But I think that there's a little bit more nuance in some of our responses than yeah. Well, and quite the responses frankly, of a lot of men. Oh, sorry. No, go on. Yeah. Well, and quite frankly, I mean, that's something that we have to deal with as women in general, no matter what it is that yeah. we're that we're dealing with. It's not just art. It's everyday life. We, we constantly have to navigate worlds where people actively work against us and disrespect us, uh, discriminate against us, try to limit our opportunities and our potential. And we've always had to fight against that, but while working with it. And yeah. we've just naturally have had to figure out how to do that and so we do it much better than men do because they've never had to deal with it yeah yeah I, and i mean i don't and i think that that's something that a lot of men a lot of very, a lot of good men men who really want to understand and want to be a part of this conversation and and find this stuff important and i i think the, that someone like like the guy who tweeted um who tweeted that and that i that we have the conversation with was exactly that. He wants to be able to understand these films and also deal with the fact that this film that he loves was made by someone that he abhors. And that's something that he's obviously not as accustomed to, to thinking about. Maybe he's done it before, but subconsciously, or maybe it's just not something that has particularly come into his purview. But you, you know, I've seen that with a lot of men recently who just respond to it being like, oh wow, this is really difficult. It's like, and, and the women are sitting by going like, yeah, no shit. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. it is really difficult. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Tell me all about how hard this <laughs> is for you, please. <laughs> and, and I do empathize because they're being asked to understand something that they've never really had to. And, and they're trying, you know, and you got to give them credit for that. But, yeah. um, but also, you know, I've said it before, men shouldn't be allowed to review things. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Today I was at work and I was talking to my coworker who is a guy and he, um, he made a comment about men being in charge of something and he goes I'm starting to think men just shouldn't be allowed to run anything and I said oh <laughs> I've been feeling that way for a long time he goes yeah we really can't be trusted and I'm like no you really can't <laughs> and then I, I quoted the line for that's actually at the beginning of our podcast the line from from Sister Suffragette, mm -hmm. that we adore men individually. We agree that as a group, they're rather stupid. So, um, sorry, guys. Well, <laughs> it, it reminds me, I don't know if either of you watch Bob's Burgers, uh, but there's there's a line between Bob and, and his favorite customer, Teddy, where they're talking about, what they're talking about is actually bronies, the brony subculture. Mm -hmm. um, but at one point, they're, like, like, they're, they're having this conversation just like, 
just like, why do men have to ruin everything? I don't know, but we kind of do. <laughs> just like everything, all of the war, and now this. Like, the and it's they're talking about thing, the bronies yeah. when they say they're that. They're talking oh. about the bronies. Yeah, they're talking about bronies. Poor bronies, bronies. Ruining, every, ruining everything. Men have to ruin everything. <laughs> Uh, so funny. All right. Well, moving on. Um, sad, sad news, you guys. Mom and dad are getting divorced. <laughs> oh, Disney, my God. And, Disney and Sony are at an impasse, but apparently might still be able to work things out because the person who wrote that doesn't know what impasse means. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so the news broke yesterday that Disney and Sony are having some breakdown of discussions over the future of Spider-Man and the MCU and because Disney has actually been leasing the character from Sony they had a deal uh, so that they could bring him in make him an Avenger and then I, I don't I've never really understood how this deal was supposed to work I had been I originally heard it was a like a three movie thing and then I heard it was supposed to expire in like 2021 or something I don't know it's never been very clear to me but the fact is <laughs> that they were working on negotiations and something broke down in the process and now supposedly it's Spider-Man's out of the MCU but this is this this story has been changing every two minutes um, but oh the fanboy tears that is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to talk about Kim you are I know you're focusing your efforts on classic film these days but you've been very entrenched in the geek community for a long time so what's your twitter feed looked like the last two days inconsolable <laughs> completely inconsolable oh, I mean man. as I mean I've said it before I'm 33 so the first my first spider-man memories are toby mcguire so i can't say that i'm you know absolutely broken broken hearted but i mean the fact is that the thought of spider-man returning to sony has the marvel fanboys in complete fits because for the first time quote unquote that they can remember i think they've they've gotten their dream spider-man i mean i I don't know. I didn't hate the Andrew Garfield ones. I liked the Tobey Maguire ones. But in what I keep seeing and what I completely agree with, and I think, Lauren, I believe you said something similar. You know, suddenly we've shifted from, oh, my God, Disney is terrible. House of Mouse will own us all. To, oh, my God, Disney, why are you doing this to us? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, people are just so ridiculous about this. It's so weird um because yeah there was like everyone's upset that disney's buying everything but then when they don't buy the one thing they want them to have then it's like oh i can't believe sony's so terrible i did find it interesting <laughs> that sony's uh sony stock uh, sony stock price plummeted yesterday after this news oh, came out really yeah. i didn't hear that i don't know how much it dropped by but apparently they lost a few points so people were pretty mad and that leads to speculation that Disney planted the story to try to force Sony to come back and, and reach an agreement. I That's what I've heard. I've heard a lot of people also hypothesizing that this is Disney kind of swaying the market and swaying the public opinion to get Sony to come back. Yeah. And basically and what it... It's just scary. Yeah. That's incredibly scary if Disney's got that kind of sway. <laughs> Well, of course Disney has that kind of sway. They've got more <laughs> money than God. So, I mean, it's it's insane. They practically have a printing press underneath Disneyland right now. So, yeah, I just, this whole thing is so weird because everyone acts like Sony has never made a good Spider-Man movie when, like, Spider-Verse just won Best Animated Feature. Uh, yeah. Spider-Man 2 is still considered by many people to be one of the best comic book movies ever made. So it's like... I was just going to say, I will defend Spider-Man 2 oh, to the death. Yeah. I liked that Spider movie. Spider-Man's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's... It, I don't know. I, I mean, my thing is, I really like Tom Holland, and I really like the way they incorporated him into mm -hmm. the MCU, but 
Also, if he's not back, it would kind of suck the way they left things in Far From Home. But, <laughs> but I mean, see, oh well. See, that's such what an I important see. part. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I know. I was just because that that is what I want to see. I want to see this happen because I want to see how the <laughs> fuck they deal with that. You're because sick. I think it's hilarious. I mean, I, I've never, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm not a person who's particularly invested in the MCU. I, I have enjoyed some of the films. I have not enjoyed some of the others. You know, I can take or leave a whole bunch. But watching this, I'm just like, okay, so like, because I saw Far From Home. And I was like, okay, so what happens? Because your whole fucking brand is based upon it. Like your entire, like the next phase, you kind of set all this up. Now what? You know, I, I really want to yeah. know. Um, well, they well, went interesting. nuts. They yeah. rejuggled their whole schedule when they brought Spider-Man in the first time, the way yeah. they brought him in in Civil War, and then they shifted everything. They sunk mm -hmm. so much into getting him in there. Now they're, uh, we'll see. My my theory, and I posted this earlier on Twitter, but I really think that what will happen is Disney will man manage a deal with Sony for at, for one more movie. Because apparently Tom Holland supposedly is contracted for two more, but those don't have to be produced by Disney. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Sony and Disney will work it out for one more movie that will wrap up Tom Holland's storyline in the MCU and then release that character back and then either Sony will cancel the last movie and release him altogether from the character or they'll make one more movie with him as Spider-Man that's straight up a Sony movie and that would be a way to uh, make like introduce future movies for them without having to reboot the character again because for some reason they keep thinking they have to reboot it even yeah. though like uh, if, other if Uncle Ben has to die again, <laughs> oh I'm going to be gosh, pissed. I, know. I cannot watch that again. I am so bored. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, and the <laughs> way that he was introduced this time where they didn't bother with the spider and they didn't deal with any of the, you know, he just is living with Aunt May and it's fine. You know, I, I liked yeah. the fact that they skipped all that because they know that we know it and we don't need to see it again. So we'll see what Sony does. I don't know. They've got a lot of... I mean, they can put a lot into the future of Spider-Verse. They can do so much with that, especially with the way that they opened it up. They could do yeah. standalone movies of every incarnation of Spider-Man if they want to. And that would be pretty awesome if it was along the lines of what they did with Spider-Verse. So, I don't know. We'll see. But, anyway, that happened, and it's still <laughs> ongoing. And who knows? By the time this episode goes up, the whole thing could be resolved, and this could all be old news. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, well, that's what's so exhausting about the fan reaction is that it was like the world had ended. Oh yeah. I mean, like watching it, and you know, and I saw a whole. There was a whole bunch of. I mean, we were talk. We were all talking about it. There was a whole bunch of different reactions, but some of the fans were just like losing their shit, and I was like, guys. It's a dude in a spider outfit. Like, I know that these characters are important to you, but I am certain you will be fine. Whatever happens to Spider-Man, whether he goes back to Sony or stays with Marvel, I am positive this will be okay. One person... Like, see, Spider-Man takes it to a whole new level. I mean, we're, you know, we're counting to certain men, you know, who I've had in my life, who thankfully I don't have to deal with anymore. That character speaks to a particularly alienated, a particularly picked on insecure level of toxic masculinity as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, Captain America speaks to some, but I mean, and not, yes, not, not all men, not all fanboys, no, but it's that really, that's a, was, that's an important character for some of those people yeah there was one person that i will not name i will not out him but uh he tweeted yesterday so if you really want to know who it was just go check out my twitter and see who i retweeted um but he tweeted the article and he's like this is soul crushing and i was like <laughs> really soul crushing really i mean i, think I, I know okay. who that was <laughs> yeah you do <laughs> i'm looking now <laughs> Yeah, it was so funny. I was just like, all right, will no one think of the children? <laughs> but one of my well, favorite tweets just popped up. 
this it, this came up this morning and I actually linked it in the show notes. This mm-hmm. is from Durex India. <laughs> did you guys look at it? Yes. yes. I did. All right. Yeah. Well, for anybody who perfect. doesn't know what Durex is, this might be a little confusing, but uh, yeah, it's a picture. It's red. It looks like Spider-Man's suit, kind of, and it's got the eyes, and then it says, the end came too soon. The feeling <laughs> is mutual. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Well played, Durex India. Well played. I mean, props to whoever, to like the social media manager, or whoever was over there going, who like looked at that and was like, my time has come. We can like, sell condoms. They're just like, yes, I, I have an idea. Like, <laughs> Like, props. I just seriously. imagine how fun it would have been to be in that room and watching them just giggle at their own humor, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I, really, I, I respect be that. totally laughing at myself. <laughs> yep. Anyway, uh, so moving on, we had new movie news because some of us can't get enough of Keanu Reeves in any form on our screens. And apparently that includes Lana Wachowski. Oh, I always say that name wrong. Dang it. Wachowski. I always yes. said Wachowski. Wachowski. But... I always I, I think, yeah, know. I've heard Wachowski. I think, yeah, I think you're right. Oh, I'm tired, guys. It's been a long week. Lana <laughs> Wachowski, who you may recall was the director of a little film franchise, well, co-director, of a little film franchise called The Matrix, um, there's going to be a fourth movie. And Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss are both coming back for it. So, I really want to be excited. Because it's Keanu well, Reeves. I mean, Keanu Reeves is riding about as high as he's had. But am I the only I, am I the only ones that remembers the sequels? Yeah, I refuse I mean, to acknowledge the existence of any sequels to the Matrix. So I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, they, <laughs> it's like how quickly we've forgotten because everybody was riding really high before those two, and suddenly it's I, I I've, I'm honestly I have been stunned by the giddiness in the reaction on social media by it. I mean, more power to her. I hope she absolutely nails it, and we, you know, that it bounces back to the joy that we had with the first one. Yeah, I, I've always wondered what it was that happened with the second and the third movies, because I think part of the problem was the fact that they didn't write all of it out as a trilogy before they did the first one, and so they were yeah. kind of trying to figure it out as they went along, and I think that caused some some issues. So I don't know what the plan is for this one. I do think it's interesting, Lily doesn't seem to be writing or directing this, so I don't know what's yeah. going on there. Yeah, the article I saw said, yeah, she's nowhere, she's not coming anywhere near it. Yeah, yeah I, so what's that about? I don't know. I mean, I, I am one of those people that I'm I'm excited about this cause just because I think it's a cool idea. And also, given everything that has happened with The Matrix as kind of a cultural thing um, over the years, I really, I just want to see the Wachowskis come back. And even if it's just one Wachowski, that's fine. Um, come back and just, like, stick it to those fucking fanboys. Uh who have used, you know, you have used red pilling and all of that stuff as, as like, MRA bullshit. It's just like, no, two trans women made that movie. And a, and a trans woman is going to make this movie. And I like that. I'm excited about that. Um, that being said, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, two, the, the two sequels. I actually really like The Matrix Reloaded. Um just because it's a fun action movie uh, right up until you get to the architect stuff, at which point I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, I literally don't remember any of the details about Reloaded or Revolution. You totally remember the scene with the architect. You go, like, Google it on, you know, look, look it up on YouTube. You definitely know that scene. Um, but I will, say, I will say, I sent a message to some of my friends from high school because back in high school, uh, the final Matrix film came out when our, I think, I believe it was our senior prom. And several of my friends and myself decided that rather, go, rather than go to senior prom, we were going to get dressed up as Matrix characters and go see the, the last Matrix movie and then go to prom. 
<laughs> so so that's what we did. So I texted some of my friends and just like, guys, we gotta we're gonna get dressed up before we go to prom and, and go see the Matrix and they were like, What the hell are you talking about? They'd completely forgotten and then I reminded them and I was like, Remember that? Remember how cool we were in high school, y'all? <laughs> they were like, oh, no, no, That is we, delightful. We don't. Uh, They're like, We buried yeah. that memory for a reason, Lauren. <laughs> hey, it was fun. It was fun. The prom sucked anyways. Like we we just we literally showed up in like long leather jackets and shit like that. So and sunglasses. <laughs> hmm. That's, yeah, that sounds fun. It was fun. Anyways. I didn't go uh, to prom. I'm, I'm being, I, I'm jealous. So, cause I wasn't even cool enough to do that. <laughs> All right. But anyway, that is going to start uh, filming early next year. And I mean, so we've got matrix four. We had John wick three this year. Um, we have... He'll sandwich it in between John Wick movies. Well, and they're, they're finishing up filming Bill and Ted 3. Yeah. I mean, can we get a, a speed 3 at some point and bring Keanu and Sandra back together? I'd be all about oh that. My let's God. just do all... I would like, let's just that. do sequels I want of all that. of his movies. Like, all of them. No, I'd, I'd totally be into that. The Lake oh, House yeah. 2. Yes! Yes! Let's do it. <laughs> let's rank the go. shit out of that. <laughs> All right. Um, did we get any questions this week? We did not get any questions this week. But we threw everyone off Boring. with our early recording. Yeah, but yeah. we did get some trailers. Um, let's start with the one I want to get out of the way and then talk about the one that I could talk about for an hour. Um, <laughs> so earlier we were talking about movies, about topics that affect women being written and directed by men. And uh, when it, you know it, a trailer for one of those dropped just this week, actually, today. Um, the movie is Bombshell. It stars Charlize Theron. I'm going to get all this wrong. Um, Margot Robbie and Nicole Kidman, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they are Megan Kelly, Gretchen Carlson, and uh, someone else. And insert Fox Blonde right. number two. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Sounds um, about right. Margot I'm Robbie plays Kayla Pospisil. I, I don't know who that is. But anyway, um, this is the three, wem three of the women that worked at Fox News and accused Roger Ailes of sexual harassment and brought him down. And so now there's a movie about it. And it's directed by Jay Roach and written by Charles Randolph. Great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, uh, Because well, I want to see the director of Meet the Parents and Austin Powers' spin on the Fox News scandal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, a lot of men and women were just losing their minds today over this trailer. I was just sitting there like, okay, so we're making a movie that I suppose makes heroes out of three women nobody particularly likes or cares much about um persevering over a man everyone hated and is now dead and nobody cares about because he's dead like i i just don't understand the interest in this movie and then on top of that it's written and directed by men and i was actually talking to a friend today who was just like well why can't men write and direct good movies. Like, men can write and direct good movies about this stuff. And I'm like, it's not, it's not, I know, I know. And I was just like, it's not a matter of whether they can. It's the fact that it's not their story to tell and they shouldn't. <laughs> when I said that, he was just like, yeah, okay, that's a good point. So. You need to stop and think if you I should. Know. Exactly. Listen to <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum has all the wisdom. I was to edit point there. <laughs> And that Jeff Goldblum quote, quote. Yes, that quote is timeless, and it applies to so many, so many situations, including and especially this one. Don't be so, so many, preoccupied with whether you can. Stop and think whether so you should. So many Hollywood mistakes could have exactly. been remedied if they had just kept that quote in mind. Exactly. Kim, what did you think of this trailer? I... I watched it late after all the hype. I kind of remembered it was... It popped up as so I was watching it on my ride home. I, I'm right there with you, Karen. I, I'm, I mean, I hate to say it, but we, we all know how those Fox women are seen in, 
popular culture. Megan Kelly is not the most liked person on, you know, Gretchen Carlson. I'm not even sure what happened to her. And I bet most people couldn't put, pick the third one out of a lineup. They were trying to turn that moment into something, but it didn't particularly hit with me. I mean, the only thing I was really thinking of was, wow, Charlize Theron is a pretty good Megyn Kelly. <laughs> But honestly, before this trailer popped up, I'd forgotten this movie existed. And when I, when I heard people talking about Bombshell, I was like, oh, is something Marilyn Monroe? Something Hedy Lamarr? What's in And I was like, oh, Fox. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not excited for it. I mean, I'll check out more as I see it, but I don't need this in my life. Yeah. Lauren? <sighs> That uh, uh, <laughs> I said I was gonna like make a high pitched screeching noise for three minutes. I'm not gonna do that, but yeah, I I mean I, I I agree with both of you. This this is like this is this is the Me Too story we do not need. The only interest I could possibly have in this was if it was written and directed by women. It's not. Um, so I I really do not care. I, you know, there's some interesting elements that could be brought out, maybe. Um, partially because these women are generally dis, you know, th this is this is generally disliked, but and they're coming out of a very you know toxic masculine culture, uh, you know, and Fox News has been notorious for that, and Ailes was a part of that. But there's there've been all kinds of things about Fox News and um, and the and the culture of masculinity and the culture of femininity there, but I. I just, I don't believe, men should not make these kinds of films, men should not tell these stories, uh, and, and I don't see this, other than the fact that these are very talented actresses, I don't see this as being a particularly interesting or a particularly good film. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this is going to be fascinating, but it, it does not enthuse me at all. No. See, the more I, the more I sit here and think about it, and I, you know, I could very well be wrong. I, you know, I will withhold all, all most of my judgment. But Jay Roach directing a film like this to me is equivalent to fairly directing Green Book. Mm. It's yeah, the, that's actually, it's the yeah. same tone deaf move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we'll see how it plays out when he, when we actually see the movie. But it would not surprise me at all if it ends up being very similar as far as like a very tone deaf approach to this very serious topic. And that's the thing. Like, I don't want to sound like I don't care about what happened to Gretchen Carlson and Megan Kelly, because they deserve to be treated with respect in the workplace by men, just as much as anybody else does. And nobody should be sexually harassed, no matter who they are. But it's just this story. I just don't, I don't want to see it in a movie. I don't, if I want to know their stories, I can read their books. I haven't read their books. I was say they've all written multiple. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But uh, this is expected to be released December 20th, which means uh, I guess we just found out what AFI is doing for their closing night showcase. Because <laughs> <laughs> everything else is going to other festivals earlier. So, yeah, I was like, oh, cool. That'll be fun. <laughs> anyway. But we had a movie trailer that came out, I think it was last week, it was after we recorded the last episode, yeah. and this is a movie that we are very, I think I, I think we're all very excited for, although we have some interesting, varied thoughts about what it all means. Paul Feig, our love, our honorary dame, Paul Feig, his new movie is Last Christmas, and it stars... Oh, did we... Oh, okay. I've, I've forgotten about this trailer. <laughs> oh, yeah. This stars Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones and our love Henry Golding as two people who meet and we don't know exactly what, how or when or where, but they meet and stuff happens. This also has Michelle Yeoh in it and Emma Thompson who wrote the screenplay with Brian E. Kimmings. So, what do y'all think of this trailer? I would have thought you guys would have discussed it last week, honestly. Um, I will say, the one thing that I watched it, I enjoyed it, I, I'm as much for a sappy rom-com as the next, and I'm a Henry Golden convert. 
man, the man is beautiful. The man should be bond. It's literally every nice thing I could say in the book. If the rumors that people seem to think are going around on Twitter come up to be true, I'm going to be pissed because <laughs> I enjoyed that until those everybody started giving their half-baked theories on it. And then I'm like, but that's so lame. I expect more from Emma Thompson and Paul Feig. That needs to not be the case because I, I watched it before coffee. I didn't pick up on any of that. I mean, I, I will freely admit I don't. See, a, it took me a long time to figure out the twist of the sixth sense before I saw the film. But it's, it's just <laughs> let's let's not. <laughs> well, see. I mean, we'll see what happens. I don't know, Lauren. Yeah, I was gonna say. See, I I have faith. If this was anyone else, if this was just like a generic director, generic writer, you know, I I would probably be like, yeah, this. I know how it looks. The fact that it's Emma Thompson writing it, the fact that it's Paul Feig directing it, leads me to believe that there is more to what the initial trailer is showing us. Um, Which is a long trailer, by the way. It's three minutes long. It was. It yeah, was very and, much was. and I mean, there's there are trailers that completely spoil the structure of the film, and, and that, that has happened, but it's such a... The twist that everyone has been talking about is such a, a simplistic and hokey twist that I feel like there's going to be, you know, it might be included in it, but I feel like there's going to be more to it. So I'm, I'm willing to go along because of these creators, uh, you know, and, and if that's what it turns out to be, and it's just that kind of a, a sappy romantic comedy, then, you know, fine. But I, that's not what I expect from them. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think that, I think that what we assume is the big twist is actually not going to be a big twist it's going to be i mean i think it's going to be part of the story but i don't think that's going to be what the big deal is and i think there's there's more coming paul feig is too smart of a filmmaker to do something so simple and cheap so if it yeah if it is the case that what we think is possibly coming is there's definitely more to it than that it's not that simple and it's not that it's not something that you could just pick out from knowing the lyrics to last Christmas. <laughs> so, you know? Well, yeah, and I mean, even just thinking about, you know, I remember when Spy came out, and my initial reaction to that film was like, oh, that looks kind of stupid. And then I actually saw the movie, and it was completely different from what I expected it to be. Even exactly. though it did yeah. hit some of the tropes that, it, you know, I was like, oh, I, I know what kind of tropes it's going to hit. And then it went off and did its own thing, and it, it's it's one of my favorite comedies. I love it. So I'm I really do trust him. And I also trust Emma Thompson. I mean, Emma Thompson is not yeah. a stupid woman and she is not a stupid writer. That's uh, true. So that combination, yeah, I, I think that there's more to it than what people are assuming. Yeah. I mean, so Emma Thompson, she wrote Nanny McPhee. She uh, wrote additional dialogue for Pride and Prejudice. She wrote Sense and Sensibility and yeah. I believe won an Oscar for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she knows what she's doing. She's not an idiot. And I think that they definitely wouldn't be stupid enough to make the trailer that obvious if they were going to make the story that basic. So, But I'm excited and we will find out November 8th what this is all about and we get to bask in the Henry Golden glory <laughs> and I cannot wait <laughs> so uh, were there any other trailers that we had this week those are the only ones that I could think of that I mean there were a bunch of other trailers but those are the only ones that I the only other thing I watched was that underwater that was about yeah it. I don't want to talk about that one yeah <laughs> unless you guys do no, I'm good. I already talked about the Meg earlier, and that's exactly what I thought. Yeah, that with, trailer. with Kristen's boyfriend, Jason Statham. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we did have a movie that's actually out today because it was a, one of those weird mm -hmm. Wednesday releases, but Kim and I both saw it. That's Ready or Not, which is the story of not Margot Robbie, but Samara Weaving. <laughs> she plays. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how many people really thought that was Margot Robbie. I mean, there is definitely a striking resemblance. But uh, yeah, Ready or Not is the story of a young bride who joins a very wealthy family and finds out that they have this tradition where whenever somebody new joins the family, they have to play a game on their wedding night 
with the whole family because that's not awkward and she draws the hide and seek card and then it turns out that's the one card you don't want to get and his whole family all of her new in-laws are trying to kill her Kim what did you think of ready or not you know I had an absolute blast with it I went into it not expecting really mo much of anything and in, in truth I actually only RSVP'd from a fangirly type side. There's a few gentlemen in there from Canadian television who I had actually, who I kind of have crushes on. So it was like, oh, they're in it. I might as well check it out. And, you know, I'm not a horror aficionado. I'm not, you know, tend to stay away from that genre. I had a lot of fun. Just all of those. I thought the characters really sold it for me. And of course, it's probably not a good thing that as I'm sitting here trying to think of names, you know, I can't do it. But um, Christian Brunn, his, his what, brother-in-law character, you know, trying to figure out how to work his crossbow, I thought was <laughs> absolutely precious. He reminded that me was... of Ortho from Beetlejuice. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he is so he is actually one of the reasons that I yeah, I've I think I've, I've talked so much about murder. I've talked on Twitter and such about Murdoch Mysteries up, you know, a Canadian procedural that I watch. He's on it. And he's an absolute gem. And then if I were 16 years old all over, Mark O'Brien is the 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 the, the husband, the young the young husband. I thought was he was absolutely precious. Um. You know, watching from an arc perspective, I liked how they handled. I liked how they handled the horror. I liked how they handled the main character, Grace. I felt like it played out very well. I thought they. I enjoyed how they worked with the jump scares, with the how they had her character evolve. The shit that they put her through. <laughs> And some of the, you know, some of the worries there that it's going to be too predictable, too formulaic, you know, they, I mean, and I just said in the last discussion that I can't usually see twists. They did, you know, quick twist, 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 and I would not have seen that ending coming, no spoilers, of course, but I was completely satisfied by the end of it. Yeah, see, I, I didn't feel like that. One of the things I appreciate is that it didn't rely on a big twist at the end. It didn't like, mm -hmm. and, and uh, some people were saying it was predictable, but I didn't feel like it was even predictable so much as inevitable. I think that some of the, I things... don't know how you could predict no. what ends up happening, but I, but I, <laughs> right. But I think, yeah, especially, but I think the way that it, that it works out, the way everything goes, there's this sense of like, even though I didn't see stuff coming, when it happens, it just felt like, yeah, that's definitely where they were going with this, and this makes total sense, because mm -hmm. because they laid the foundation in the right way, but you couldn't necessarily guess what was going to happen next. There were certain things that it was like, oh, okay, this is there, so that's definitely going to happen, but even then, it was still very satisfying when certain things did happen, even though you could totally see them coming, but oh my gosh, Lauren... <laughs> You're going to love this movie so much. <laughs> I think so, I too. I, I really yes. hope she will. Yeah. I... Well, I am seeing it on Friday, and I am honestly Yay. really looking forward to it. Every trailer that I've seen of it, I've just been like, this is like, you know, this is this is the horror film that was made for me. I, there seem to be a lot yep. of films made for me this year, and I'm very excited. So, I mean, Samara weaving her dialogue throughout the entire movie, it was like, this is just stuff I say at work every day. Like, <laughs> fuck this. <laughs> Shit. Like, cause, like, she's, I love the fact that she's just delightfully foul-mouthed, but it's not offensive, like, like, it's just she's just so she's just so charming because she's so you know like rough around the edges and stuff and like I just love her character she's a lot of fun and I was not into like the OC and stuff back in the day so I, I totally missed the boat on Adam Brody but I would be totally fine with him being a thing now because <laughs> see I was a, I was a Ben McKenzie fan um. during the OC days and totally looked past the Adam Brodiness 
between that and that little itty bitty part he had in Shazam, I'm completely <laughs> stunned at what I missed. Are we ready for a Brody Sans? I, I think we're ready for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Brody Sans can happen. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> anyway, will say I'm... I was prepared oh. to be nitpicky about the because I mean I don't think I'm spoiling anything. You know what where what happens to the maids. Mm-hmm. how much of the violence is kind of stemmed around the maids. I was feeling initially really nitpicky about that and a little frustrated that that was the angle they were taking. But then they, with the switches they pull at the end, I was actually quite pleased. Yeah, well, and I think with the way that this family was and the things that they're about, it kind of made sense that they would that certain things would happen the way they did. You know what I mean? That, that they would do what they do. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I love how you guys are, like, skirting yep. around these things. You know, the thing that happens, that, yeah, that makes Exactly. Anybody sense. who has seen this movie already knows exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, it's it's so much fun. And I, I like the fact, because, I mean, I love good horror comedy movies, and I like the fact that this is one that... this. Because a lot of them are like comedy first with horror horror there too, like Ghostbusters or what we do in the shadows or or you know Zombie Land or whatever. This I feel is more it's more of a horror comedy like how Scream is, where it's like the story is taking itself seriously, but the way they tell it is funny as hell. You I know put what it I mean? up with like Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which is one of like yeah. a yeah. horror comedy that I really like. Yeah, yeah, where, like, they're, they're not being, it's, it's not like, it's not like all sight gags, or, you know what I mean, like, there's, and it's, like, the primary, the primary tone is horror, but they use a horror lot of Horror that understands comedy. horror. They, they can yeah. integrate comedy to help enrich the horror. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's great. It's so much fun. This is a perfect way Honestly, I think this was the perfect movie to end the summer and to transition into fall. Agreed. So I'm so glad this is like kind of coming when it is. It's perfect release date. Go see it. Go enjoy the crap out of it. Tell us what you think about it. And Lauren, I can't wait for you to watch it. <laughs> oh, Friday. Return and report. Excellent. Friday, yeah. Awesome. Well, is there anything else we wanted to oh, talk I, about? I, What's I, everyone been watching lately? What have you watched, I, Lauren? I do want to give a really quick shout out because I've been watching What We Do in the Shadows on yes. Hulu. Yes! <laughs> Finally, you know, because I don't, I don't have cable, you know, and but I do have Hulu, and then it came out on Hulu. And I, I've said it before, I love the movie. And it was a little bit like, ooh, is there, how are they going to do the show? You know, it's kind of structured almost for a TV show, but it's about getting the right actors also and getting the right edge of comedy. It's hilarious. Like, I, I just, I absolutely adore it. I love the characters that they've done. I like the fact that it, it keeps the same kind of humor, but it's still different. It's not like they're, they're not just redoing the original film. They're kind of expanding it. There's so much humor. I mean, you've got Doug Jones is in it as the Baron, who I just, I love his yes. bits. Uh, Matt Berry is a gem. I, I love him. They're all so funny. I'm really glad to have... Um, I, I can't remember the actress's name, but Nadia, uh, the, the Natasha Dimitri. Yes, yeah, I she's, love her. She is great. She is very funny. Um, every, I mean, everyone is like it's it's just a really well done show. I'm enjoying the crap out of it. It's it makes me want to watch the movie again, um, but it's also a great expansion of everything. So yeah, so anyone who hasn't seen it yet, like get thee to Hulu and and check out that How- show because it, it's very funny. <laughs> It's so great. How far have you gotten? What episode are you on? I have just gotten past the the Vampire Council, the Tribunal. Oh my gosh, I yeah. love that episode so much. The cameos um, in it were glorious. The cameos are great. I love the way they handle the cameos, too. Just... Yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally related to the Skype problems. <laughs> It's it's hilarious, so and much. and Beanie Feldstein is in it. <laughs> like she yes. she pops yep. up, and I was just like, "What? Like is she, she, okay, like okay, awesome? I like that." You know? Uh huh. 
Yeah, my favorite guest spot was Vanessa Bear, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the emotional vampire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> emotional vampire and the energy yeah the the relationship between the emotional uh -huh. vampire and the energy vampire i love craig robinson like i think he's a great vampire mm -hmm. yeah it's so great anyway yes watch it on hulu it's awesome do yourself a favor i'm so glad anything else you've been watching you want to mention uh well i'm gonna have my review of blackmail up on um uh, up on the website tomorrow i finally got the keynote release uh, of Hitchcock's Blackmail. It is quite a film, and I, I had forgotten how how cynical and nasty and good it is. It's an hour and 25 minutes, and it is probably one of his best films. Uh, I mean, I, I, I just finished writing the review. I've sa I, say, I say more in my writing, but um, it, it really is. I, I highly recommend going out to find it. Also, the Kino release has both the original um, sound version and the original silent version. Blackmail was released in both versions. It's the first uh, sound film that Hitchcock made, but it was originally made as a silent film, and, and then um, sound was integrated later. So you've got this really interesting combination going on between the use of sound and the use of dialogue and the use of ambient noise and the use of, of image. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Like you get a chance to see this movie. Kino has done a great job with it. it there is also a, um, a streaming version of it that is up on the Criterion channel right now. Go watch it. Like, if, if you like silent movies, if you like Hitchcock, if you like thrillers, if you just like good films. Like, seriously, it's, it's one of his best. Awesome. Thank you. Kim, anything else you want to shout out? Oh, I've been, a lot of my week, I've been marathoning the ghost and mrs mirror uh 19 so 1968 television series based on the movie which was based on a book you know you know book written by a female author and then the 1968 series was created by a woman named jean holloway and the fact that there was a woman who created a series around that time i wanted to watch it through so i could you know hopefully do some more content on it and it has been so much fun i mean it is a little you can see where the writers the other writers start kicking in because there's little inconsistencies but the episodes that holloway is writing in particular are just so good and such just a cute breath of fresh air hope lang is such a great character in it you know the and I wasn't sure what to expect, especially a remake of a movie that, that that's that legendary. And it's it, when they focus on the, you know, the romance and the fantasy of it's incredibly cute. I've been singing Charles Nelson Riley's praises on Twitter a lot right now as well. <laughs> he's at, he's one of my favorites and is just he's delightful in that as well and it's i'm about halfway through season one and have one more season to go awesome i haven't really had time to watch anything the only show i'm keeping up with right now is bachelor in paradise i am ashamed but i'm not actually you gotta allow yourself one <laughs> you know yeah you know in tully how she watches like i can't remember what show it is but she like is super embarrassed about it but she just really needs the mental break that's what it is for me with bachelor in paradise mm -hmm. it's like it just gives me a time to just like turn off the thinking part of my brain and just enjoy the dumbness it's great i love it uh anyway all right, well, that's going to wrap things up then, I suppose. Uh, just a few things we wanted to mention. I forgot to mention at the top of the episode, we are still running our um, our What's in the Bag contest. Is it Kristen and Jason Statham's Love Child? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Shit's getting weird, man. That's all I got to say. <laughs> This contest, has to end. Bag, man. this contest has to end so that we <laughs> can, like, stop making this stuff up. <laughs> One more week, everyone. One more week. See, you guys got to give us better guesses because I'm running out of shit to say. Um, but yeah, so tell us what you think is in the bag. Find our retweet of it, our tweet of it. You retweet it. Tell us what you think is in the bag and you are automatically entered to win. It's just that easy. And, of course, there are lots of ways to help 
follow us and support us and stuff of course we are always looking for a few good patrons and you can do that at patreon.com slash citizen dame we are going to be you know as the season as the summer is coming to a close we're going to have a little bit more time to get back into the swing of our bonus episodes so we'll be doing more of those um, of course, if you want some of our awesome, awesome merch, you can go to our Zazzle store, zazzle.com slash citizen dame. Don't want to commit and don't necessarily need a t-shirt, but still want to help us out. That's our Ko-Fi account. That's ko, K-O hyphen fi, F-I dot com slash citizen dame. Then if you just want to follow us and be weird and stalkerish or just say hello, <laughs> you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at citizen dame pod. We sometimes, I guess, go to Facebook. That's facebook.com slash citizendame. And you can email us, citizendamepod at gmail.com, or visit our website. Well, you should visit our website weekly anyway, because Lauren and Kristen are keeping that going with awesome content. That's citizendamepod.com. You can also find our individual Twitters. Lauren, where are you? I am at LH Business. And Kim. At KPier624. You can find Kristen at journeys underscore film, and I am at Karen M. Peterson. And that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you soon. If we don't find her and perform the ritual, we're all dead. Found her. Ah! I'm it, Emily! I don't know what I'm doing!